Today, in Moscow and Kyiv, two countries at war fought over the meaning of what used to be a shared holiday, Victory Day, when Russia, Ukraine, and all the former Soviet states celebrate the defeat of Nazi Germany. But this year, the Kremlin compared Ukrainians to Nazis, and Ukrainians compared Russian actions to Nazi war crimes. Nick Schifrin begins our coverage. They filled Moscow's streets by the tens of thousands, Russians remembering family killed during World War II, mobilized by a leader leveraging an 80-year-old victory to justify today's war. With pomp, circumstance, and a show of military might, Russian President Vladimir Putin likened the Red Army's fight against the Nazis to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. You are fighting for the motherland, for its future, so that no one forgets the lessons of World War II. So there is no place in the world for executioners, castigators, and Nazis. Putin did not escalate the war or declare victory. Instead, he once again inflated Western pre-war support for Ukraine as his reason to invade. We saw how the military infrastructure was being developed, how hundreds of foreign advisors began to work. There were regular deliveries of the most modern weapons from NATO countries. The danger grew every day. Russia has preemptively repulsed an aggression. It was a forced, timely, and the only correct decision. Ukraine's rebuttal uploaded online. On the street where Kyiv usually hosts an Independence Day parade, President Volodymyr Zelensky walked past barricades and compared an unnamed Putin to Hitler. Someone is fighting for the Tsar, the Fuhrer, and we are fighting for our freedom so that the victory of our ancestors was not in vain. The one who is repeating the horrific crimes of Hitler's regime today, he is doomed because he was cursed by millions of ancestors when he began to imitate their killer, and therefore he will lose everything. And very soon there will be two victory days in Ukraine, and someone will not even have one left. We won then. We will win now, too. The Soviet army turning the Nazi six-month assault into the most ghastly military disaster in German history. Ukraine and Russia shared sacrifices in World War II. 20 million Soviets died. And across Ukraine, Nazis committed war crimes. But in Kharkiv's World War II memorial today, the only heartbeats allowed were recorded in the past and piped in by speaker. The memorial was closed by Kharkiv Mayor Ihor Terehov, whose father was a Soviet soldier. Ukraine was entirely occupied by Nazi Germany, and Ukraine was liberated with the help of our allies, the United States, Great Britain. The whole world liberated us from the Nazis and fascists. And today, history is repeating itself. The United States, Great Britain, they're all providing us with weapons. Well, welcome, folks. Today in the U.S., President Biden signed the Ukraine Democracy Defense Lend-Lease Act. It borrows the name of U.S. support to allies during World War II and makes it easier to arm Ukraine. And, uh, with Putin's war once more uh, bringing uh, wanton destruction into Europe and uh, to reaffirm the enduring commitment to the future grounded in democracy, human rights, and peaceful resolution of disagreements, I'm now going to sign this bill. But at a European meeting in France today, President Emmanuel Macron ended Ukraine's hope to join the European Union quickly and said Russia's priorities needed to be considered. The terms of the discussion and negotiation will be established by Ukraine and Russia. It won't happen by ignoring or excluding one or the other. Back in Ukraine, Russia continues to bombard and try to storm Mariupol's Azovstal steel plant, the city's last holdout. For two months, hundreds of civilians have been hiding underneath Azovstal with no light or fresh air and little food and water. In the last 10 days, the UN and ICRC have escorted three convoys of families out of Azovstal. UN resident humanitarian coordinator Osnat Lubrani traveled with those convoys to the Ukrainian-held town Zaporizhia, where we sat down today. The people who you've evacuated with, what are the conditions they've faced? People that have undergone trauma, uh, living in, in, you know, 
conditions that difficult to imagine in a bunker. They haven't seen the sky. They haven't, you know, they had limited food and incessant shelling all the time. So bringing them out, the process of moving them was also not easy. There is presently uh, by the the entities that are in control of these areas uh, um, a requirement to go through a screening process. We were present with them throughout that process which was um, very lengthy and intensive and for people particularly the ones from Azovstal who have just come in putting pressure on people that already uh, have gone through a difficult time and very scary I think. Uh, for, for all of them. Um, I think that's where our, our presence with, with those um, vulnerable people that had just come out of a difficult situation was, was very important. And um, it was, you know, protection by presence, uh, being there. We're talking about screening by Russian forces. What are the Russians making the people who are leaving Mariupol go through in that screening process? I think there are a lot of probing questions. It's very lengthy and very comprehensive and very um, intense. Is it unfair? It was putting people under duress, but there was no uh, actual abuse or, or, you know, to the extent that that's why we were there. There was no... To ensure there was no abuse. Yes, exactly. What are the conditions that the people who remain in Mariupol face? Uh, right now, Mariupol is, is, you know, very much destroyed in terms of access to food and basic services. These are literally not there. I'm hoping that we can also be there for the people that are living in a very, very dire conditions. You know, there is Russian presence, but there is also the presence of other entities that are now sort of uh, uh, controlling uh, people's daily lives. In this regard, I want to say that the UN does have a presence for many years in Donetsk and Lugansk. We have, on the basis of humanitarian principles, uh, been able to engage with, um, with all of these entities to, on access, on bringing humanitarian aid. Um, so I hope that those same you know, arrangements can be worked out. It sounds like you're making a pitch to the pro-Russian separatists who you've been dealing with for many mm -hmm. years in the self-declared independent republics in Donetsk and Luhansk, who are now in Mariupol, the pitch is that you can work with them inside Mariupol. I think, yes, that's, that's the pitch. As part of the evacuation efforts, have families from Mariupol been separated? People have ended up in different, uh, in different situations uh, and, um, and, and Air raid sirens Air in the distance. Sirens. Yes, there have been instances of family separation. There were several instances where people were detained because they were either in, under investigation or were detained because they were considered um, inv involved as, you know... Meaning former combatant. soldiers or yes. former police. Right? Yes, and that involved um, separation of, of, uh, of, of those people from family members, from sometimes children. children. Yeah. Uh, sometimes children and, um, and, and siblings, but in all those instances we, we will be uh, following up. Vasnat Lubrani, thank you very much. Thank you. And a note, our coverage of the war in Ukraine is supported in partnership with the Pulitzer Center.